Hey man, welcome to the Husband Material Masterclass, How to Outgrow Porn, the most powerful way to change your brain, heal your heart, and save your relationship without fighting an exhausting battle. Before we get started, I want to show you a short video of some of the guys who have worked with me, who have experienced the power of what I'm about to share with you and talking about the difference that it's made in their lives. Check it out. I grew up, you know, struggling with pornography, you know, being exposed at a young age. And it was kind of like my security blanket. It's the only thing that I really knew. I guess it was my junior year, I was molested by my music minister. I was by myself a lot and I struggled with loneliness, even though I didn't really realize that until I got older. I felt very lost. My, my struggle with pornography and masturbation that never quite seemed to go away. I didn't do well academically uh, compared to my peers, so I had a bit of physical abuse and all that. It's been very, very challenging to understand and then have nobody to talk to about it with. My dad cheating on my mom, he made it normal in a way and would even tell me, hey, like, this is what men do. You know, there's such a deficit in knowing what it looks like to be a sexually mature adult. No one talks about it. With porn, it felt awful. I felt shameful all the time and weighed down and felt trapped, really. So I was always kind of left alone at home to fend for myself and I thought that was kind of normal. I'd been wrestling with these issues, the struggle of pornography for as long as I can remember. It was revealing a lot of secrets that I was holding on to, secrets that my body was screaming at me and I wasn't listening because all I saw was the pornography. If this does not change, we will either have to push back the wedding or we will not be able to get married. So I would go get the iPad and I would stay up all night and I would look at porn and I would feel so guilty in the morning, but it was so hard for me to stop. And I would use, just use that frustration and anger and I would usually take, I would take that frustration and anger and I would literally take a hammer to the iPad and break it. They started to change when I joined Husband Material because it taught me to, to reach into those recesses that still affect each one of us from our growing up here our teenage years you know and so if if you if you know anything about psychology it a lot of the things that we do now are because of our childhood or teenage years and so i, I found something a lot better than porn i found something a lot more enjoyable um something something that i'm passionate in i honestly just feel like a completely new person the confidence the peace of mind that that gives you um you really can't describe it the behavior has stopped and i'm be i'm able to now move forward with other goals i don't feel as tempted to go back the feeling of shame and guilt have melted away i learned how to get out of moments when i shut down i found a freedom that i'd never experienced anywhere else i felt heard and i felt like there was a space to wrestle with this and i'd never had that space before they didn't shame me for it or they didn't dismiss me but they were like yeah we're all in the same boat let's let's work on this together i now have time every morning to spend with god that's my healthy time i'm filled with so much hope and peace. Being porn free, I'm able to take care of myself a lot better. And I'm currently, you know, seeking out a, a good relationship. And I definitely feel like I'm not being led by lust. I have been free for over four and a half or coming on five years of sexual freedom. I'm not just someone who struggles with pornography or addictions, you know, I'm more than that. Isn't that awesome? Don't you want that? Gets me fired up every time I see it. And the question is, how did those guys do it? What was it that they experienced that broke through the fear and the shame and the loneliness and all of the obstacles to freedom from porn and allowed them to be transformed? That's what we're talking about today. You will learn how they did it, how they're still doing it, how we are all experiencing a deeper level of freedom in husband material than we thought was possible. And at the end of this presentation, if you stay to the end, I will introduce you to Husband Material Academy, my all-in-one solution for Christian men outgrowing porn. For now, let's talk about our goal here. My mission today 
is to replace shame with compassion, to replace confusion with clarity, and to replace despair with hope. If you feel shame about your sexuality or about the specific type of porn that you're struggling with, if you are confused about why certain things are attractive to me, why I haven't been able to stop, or if you're feeling despair and you're on the edge of giving up hope, today is for you. My prayer is for you to experience compassion and clarity and hope. Let's do this thing. You ready? Who is this class for? It is for men who are single, dating, engaged, or married. So whatever your stage of life, whatever your stage of relationship, this class is for you. It's not just for husbands. It's not just for people who want to be husbands. It's for any Christian man who desires freedom from porn or deeper freedom if you already have it. It's also for men who are tired of old school accountability. The porn recovery accountability approach is not working. (laughs) So many Christian men are struggling because they're stuck in that old system. And if you are frustrated and exhausted by that system, then you're going to see something new today. And I have to warn you, it might go against certain things that you've been taught in church or from other Christian sources. So if you are open to a different approach that might be uncomfortable, that will feel like an experiment. If you're willing to try something new, then you are in the right place. Let's start with the basics. What are the effects of porn use? Maybe you already know this, maybe you don't. So let's do a quick review. First, porn hijacks your brain. In the words of Dr. William Struthers, who teaches at Wheaton College where I went to school, we are wired for intimacy and creativity and connection. And porn interrupts that. It disrupts that. It damages our brains physically. And also, it hurts our relationships with God, with each other, with ourselves, and with our God-given purpose, our ministry, our career, our calling. It gets in the way of all that. And this next image will probably be a little bit triggering, so I want to warn you, porn also fuels sex trafficking. This is an image from the Trafficking Hub campaign, which was exposing the largest porn website in the world, Pornhub, for the way that it exploits its performers. These are some of the comments from a real video on Pornhub that people posted. They said, I don't care if she's 13, this is hot. Her crying makes it even better. Younger the better, who cares? My point here is that porn is a predator. And actually, I want to take that even further because the truth is porn exploits everyone on both sides of the screen. The porn industry targets young girls and boys and turns them into performers. And the porn industry targets young boys and girls and turns them into lifelong consumers. Here's what I'm saying. If you were exposed to porn at a young age when you were just a little boy, you were exploited by a $100 billion industry, a sexual predator that we call pornography, which targets young boys and girls before you could even really make an informed decision. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I chose porn. I chose to use it. Yes. And in a way, the young girls who are exploited as porn performers, well, they made choices too, but they were in an environment which set them up for it. And in the same way, if you're at a house where no one is talking about sex, if you have access to pornography, which is affordable, anonymous, and available, and addictive, You are set up for this. And like any sexual predator, porn takes advantage of your vulnerabilities and your core longings and it turns them against you and it turns you into a lifelong consumer. Porn is not your fault. Yes, you made choices that contributed, but porn is a predator that exploits people like you and me when we were just little boys. One time in my former Facebook group, I asked guys, all right, When were you first exposed to porn? 
And as you can see here, the most common age was 10 to 12. And in the book, How Pornography Harms by Dr. John Fobert, he says that research suggests that that age continues to get younger and younger. Little boys are being exposed to porn at ages of five or eight these days because it's accessible, it's anonymous, it's affordable, it's at their fingertips. And this is a massive insight for everyone here to understand. It is not primarily men who get hooked on pornography. It's boys. How about you? When were you first exposed to porn? When did you first experience sexual stimulation? However old you were. You were just a kid. And porn came into your life. Not seeming like a predator, but more like a pacifier. It was something that helped you get through your days. It was something that helped you survive. It was there when other people weren't there. It was exciting when life was boring. And it was an escape when you felt trapped. That's what I mean when I say that porn is a pacifier. And this perspective is completely different than what most people think about when they try to understand why are so many people using pornography so much? And they do a lot of things that don't work. And this perspective changes everything because it means that porn didn't start out in your life as a problem. It started out as a solution to the deeper problems that you were facing emotionally. It became a Band-Aid or a crutch, a type of solution, or else you wouldn't have kept using it. And the idea that porn started out as a solution is completely revolutionary because you might think that porn is your problem. And as long as you're dealing with it as a problem, it's going to persist. Let me tell you more about what I mean by this. Maybe if you're struggling with porn, you think, all right, I need Jesus, which is true. So you go to church more, you read your Bible more, maybe you memorize scripture and you pray and you ask God to take it away. But in the end, you're still not addressing the pacifier, the reason why porn is there. And because of that, it's essentially trying to slap a spiritual solution on emotional pain, trying to slap a spiritual solution on sexual brokenness. And that just doesn't work. So then you think, okay, I really have a serious problem. And you get some kind of accountability software and an accountability partner who can check up on you. And when that still doesn't motivate you and you keep coming back to it, then you think, okay, I have a really bad problem. I need some kind of counseling or therapy. And you go there and they try to help you solve your problems and become healthy. But in the end, all of these approaches are still treating porn primarily as a problem rather than a childhood solution, which has become an adult problem. You see what I'm saying? This becomes a frustrating and exhausting battle of binging on porn and then trying to purge from it and binging and purging. And in the end, the only way to avoid this exhausting battle, to get free from the battle, is to start with the boy, with the little you. For me, it's the little Drew. And as my friend Eddie Caparucci likes to say, the road to recovery goes through your childhood. In his book, Going Deeper, How the Inner Child Impacts Your Sexual Addiction, he makes this point. The road to recovery is ultimately so much deeper and straight to the point when you can begin with the little boy who is still with you all these years later. You might be 30 years old or 60 years old, but sexually, you might be 12 years old still. Emotionally, you might be six years old. And that is why I am so passionate about helping you outgrow porn, not just fight the battle again and again, but 
drop that pacifier because you don't need it anymore. Because you've grown up into an adult and it doesn't do anything for you. Just like a pacifier has no power when you get to a certain age of maturity, you just don't need it anymore. That is what happens when you change your brain and you heal your heart. So if I show you how to do this, if I show you the exact path to lasting freedom from porn, will you commit to the process? If so, wherever you are right now, say, I'm in. If you're in a public place around other people, you can just whisper it to yourself, I'm in. (laughs) Or if you're by yourself, scream it out, I'm in. If you're not saying I'm in, I wonder why. You might be thinking, but Drew, I've struggled for so long. You don't know how long this has been part of my life. It's just the way I am. Let me tell you about Chuck. Chuck said, for 40 years, I could never get control of it. Where I felt stuck in the mud with a chain around my feet and I could only go so far, coaching allowed me to take the chain off. This has transformed my heart. Chuck is the guy in that video you watched who said that he was molested by a music minister. And there's a lot more to his story that I don't need to tell you about. What I do want to tell you is that after 40 years of unwanted sexual behavior, of porn, of even acting out in person, he has got to a place where he's at peace with himself, where he's reconnecting with his wife. They've been separated and they're finally coming together. And why has it happened? Not because he was able to achieve mastery over his sexual urges, but because his heart is being transformed. That's why we're here. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how long you've been struggling with this. Your brain can change. It's called neuroplasticity. There is hope for you. You might also think, I've tried everything. I've already gone to so many programs and read so many books. Nothing has worked for me. I want to tell you about Matthew who sent me this text message. He said, Drew, I was reflecting on all the counseling I've had. I mean, in my life, as well as even in the last six years, searching for some help in the battle against a sexual addiction. I've honestly never made any headway in comparison to the last six or so weeks. There's been a lot of uncovering, which sucks, but I am at least glad I know. Thankful for you and your work, man. Let me be very clear. This journey is not easy. It sucks. You will uncover things that happened to you that maybe you had forgotten about or things that didn't happen to you that should have happened. Equally heartbreaking, but hard to face and hard to come to terms with. I mean, this journey is difficult. But if you're going in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter if you go in that direction for six years. Six weeks in the right direction will take you further towards healing and freedom than six years in an approach that ultimately leaves you frustrated and exhausted. Do you hear the difference in what Matthew's saying? Six years, even going to therapy and counseling, didn't make as much of a difference as six weeks when you have clarity about exactly where you are and where you need to go. And my friend, the road to recovery goes through your childhood. You might also say to yourself, well, this sounds really good for people who struggle with regular porn, but my fantasies and fetishes are way too messed up. I don't think I can be free. And man, this is the one that I personally resonate with the most. I had a sexual fetish that controlled me, that I hated about myself. And I kind of specialize in this area because it's so connected to my story and my unwanted sexual attraction. Let me tell you about Joe. Joe had been in recovery for 27 years, and he had been sober from alcoholism for a long time. And he was beginning to gain traction in sexual addiction, but there was a fetish that he still had no idea what to do with. He said, I have a smoking fetish, mostly around sexy women smoking certain kinds of cigarettes. It's been with me since I was 12 years old. And as we got deeper and were able to do this work of coming at that sexual attraction with curiosity and compassion and inviting Jesus into it, Joe's experienced a lot of freedom. He says, for me, the behavior has stopped and I'm able to move forward with my other goals. Isn't that awesome? 
not having to fixate and focus and be preoccupied with the same old stuff for years. He's moving on. And that's my goal. That is what I have experienced. And that's what I want to share with you. So if you're wondering, who is this Drew Boa guy? Let me introduce myself. Hi, I'm Drew. This is my family, my wife, my two kids. I also had a boy who died when he was an infant and we miss him. But this is our family right now. And we live in Santa Barbara, California, where my favorite thing to do is run up the mountains. That's my thing. That's what I love to do on the weekends if I have time. And during the week, my job is here in this office in Husband Material Headquarters, helping Christian men outgrow porn, the pacifier. And I absolutely love it, but it wasn't always this way. I was a kid who loved Jesus and hated porn, but I couldn't stop using it. When I was in college, I joined some groups and I gained a lot of freedom. I actually was leading groups. I was leading a ministry of 200 people, but in the end, after I graduated, I felt like I went all the way back to the beginning. After over a year of freedom from porn and masturbation, I relapsed. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever felt like, oh, I was gaining so much ground, and then all of a sudden, all your progress came crashing down, and you felt like you were back at the beginning, wondering if all the healing and freedom that you thought you had was an illusion? Wondering if maybe even, am I really a Christian? That's where I was in 2014. And around that same time, I became interested in this woman named Rebecca. Rebecca was four and a half years older than me. I thought she was way too mature and that she would see me as like one of her students. But there was a goofy side and an acceptance that I experienced with her that felt so right. We dated for a few months and eventually we got engaged. It was here in Santa Barbara that I asked her to marry me and she said yes. And when we were going through premarital counseling, I still remember they gave us an assignment. They said, I want you to answer two questions. One, what do you appreciate about the other person? Number two, what do you see in yourself that needs work? And I remember we were sitting on this couch in her apartment when... All of a sudden, I couldn't speak. I was staring at the carpet. I couldn't look her in the eyes. My stomach was tight. I knew what I had to say, but I didn't want to say it. Eventually, I looked up and I said, Rebecca, I'm not as free from porn as you might think. And there are some sexual fantasies and desires that I have that I haven't told you about. And in that moment, she met me with eyes of love and compassion that motivated me more than anything else ever had to do whatever it takes to give myself and her the confidence that I could take the wedding vows that we are planning on making and know that porn is in the past. I had to be 100% confident. I was so committed to her. She was so committed to me. And when we were engaged, that's when I started that journey and I went deep. I took classes across the country with Christian sex therapists. I watched every video series. I listened to every podcast. I read every book I could get my hands on. And in the end, one night I was watching a YouTube video with Dr. Patrick Carnes, who invented the term sex addiction. He coined it in the 1980s. And Carnes was talking about why specific people are attracted to different types of porn. And this blew my mind. I thought, what? You mean there's a reason behind it? You mean there's logic behind it? And I began to think about my own sexual fantasies. He said that when you're growing up, sometimes your sexual development can get stunted at a certain age. And so you become fixated on what was attractive to you at that time. And I realized that's what happened to me. That's exactly what happened to me. I was stunted when I was 13 years old and my specific sexual fantasies for orthodontics and braces had their roots very clearly at that time in my life. 13 year old Drew, when all the kids had orthodontics in middle school, that is a huge part 
of what was contributing to my arousal. And that's what took me back on this journey into my childhood that eventually allowed me to drop the pacifier and be free from the behavior of sexually acting out as well as being free from the battle. So that just wasn't stressful anymore. It wasn't a struggle anymore. And I was able to love myself. And as a result, I was able to marry Rebecca with so much joy and over a year of freedom from porn. And this time, the assurance that relapse would not just be right around the corner, ready to strike, but that I had actually outgrown porn because I had healed, because little Drew finally received the love that he needed. And that's how I became husband material. That's how I became a sexually, emotionally mature adult. And now I get to help other guys like you get the same results. I was able to publish my small group workbook, Redeem Sexuality. I was able to start coaching other men online and started the Husband Material podcast, which is probably my favorite part of this whole job. And I was able to work with one of my heroes, Jay Stringer, on the Unwanted Digital Workbook. Jay's book, Unwanted, is the one that I recommend most often to people who want to be free from porn. It's one of the best books out there. And all of this work has given me the ability to help guys like you get free. And that's why today I am revealing the exact path to lasting freedom from porn without fighting a frustrating, exhausting battle. Are you ready? Here are the three secrets to freedom from porn that I want to share with you today. Number one, five reasons why purity culture sets you up to struggle with porn. Number two, the simple trick to hack any sexual fantasy and strip porn of its seductive power. And number three, how to completely eliminate the risk of relapse without getting accountability software or giving up your smartphone. And I know that is a big promise. So stay with me if you want to hear what I have to say. Secret number one, five reasons why purity culture doesn't just hinder you. It actually sets you up to struggle with porn. Remember Patrick Carnes? Dr. Patrick Carnes, who coined the term sex addiction, in his research with hundreds of sex addicts, he began to see patterns. He said that they came from a very predictable family background, characterized by two things. Number one, they came from a family, typically, that was rigid. In other words, there are strict rules and inflexible beliefs. There are some questions we just don't ask in this family. There are some behaviors that we just don't do or else there will be very severe consequences. Rigidity, no flexibility, strict rules, inflexible beliefs. That was ingredient number one in the recipe for sexual addiction. Number two is that the family is disengaged. There's a lack of connection or closeness. Everyone's kind of in their own little separate world were people really pursuing each other, especially pursuing their hearts? How about your family? Strict rules, flexible beliefs, a general feeling of disconnection or not really feeling fully known or fully desired in the house where you grew up. He says that this is a perfect recipe for needing the pacifier of porn, a perfect recipe for turning to a kind of behavior that will allow you to break free from the rules and connect, or at least give you the illusion of that. And you know what he said is the segment of the population most likely to have a rigid, disengaged family culture? Evangelical Christians out of everybody in the United States, evangelical Christians are most likely to have strict rules and flexible beliefs and not a lot of emotional connection where people can be real, be known, be loved just as they are. Which means that for Christians, we are actually more susceptible and more likely to struggle with this stuff because we have so much shame around it. That's what I mean when I say purity culture sets you up to struggle with porn because purity culture is the typical popular evangelical Christian approach to sexuality. And let me describe it for you. Here are the five failures of purity culture 
what you want to avoid if you want to be free. Number one, toxic shame. Purity culture was a movement in the evangelical Christian church that started in the 1990s. And it used things like promises, a vow of purity, and purity rings to reinforce fear and shame around sexual activity outside of marriage. Now, I believe that it's really important to abstain from sex outside of marriage in terms of sexual intercourse. But the reasons and the motivations behind purity culture were so damaging. Let me tell you what I mean. Finish this sentence for me. I must be pure or else. Or else what? When I've taught this class before, here's how other men finish that sentence. They said, I must be pure or else I'm going to hell. God will hate me. God will reject me. I won't get into heaven. I must be pure or else I'll be dirty because sex is dirty. I'm going to be damaged goods. I'm going to be a pure husband. I'll disappoint my parents. I will ruin my future. I will ruin the ministry God called me to. I won't be acceptable and no one will want me. Do you hear the fear and the shame within this purity culture narrative? Let me tell you the way that it should be. Now, the problem with all of this is not abstaining from sex outside of marriage. I actually believe that's biblical. I believe that's wise and good. The problem is the motivation and the motivation for so many of us growing up in this silence and shame and judgment was fear. The motivation was, I must be pure or else. Now, that's the exact opposite of the gospel. Let me tell you the way it should be. In the book, How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex by my friend Rodney Wright and his wife Tracy Wright, they describe something completely different than the traditional purity ring. Rodney said, when my daughter Whitney turned 16, I wanted to motivate her to make good decisions out of seeing her internal worth and value. On her 16th birthday, he said to his daughter, Whitney, I'm giving you a ring. This ring is a value ring. This is not your promise to us. This is our promise to you. I want you to know that your value in our eyes will never change, regardless of your behavior. Whether you make good decisions in life or you make poor decisions, your worth as our daughter will never change and we will always love you. That's the gospel. That is what we all needed as kids to understand our own honor and value and worth so that we can love God and love other people with our sexuality. Instead, most of us grew up in homes where we just didn't talk about sex, except maybe this purity culture banner that said don't have sex before marriage and that ultimately led to promises and purity rings and toxic shame thinking that my sexuality is a bad thing so what happens if you accept this toxic shame and internalize it and believe that your sexuality is dirty and bad unless you're married the natural outcome of this is what we call sexual repression inside the church we have repressed sexuality Outside the church, we have released sexuality. Sexuality is you you do whatever you want. But in the church, purity culture teaches that when you have a sexual urge or an attraction or a fantasy, attack it, avoid it, or ignore it. Get rid of it. Shut it down. Repress it. And this puts us in a constant cycle of repression and release, of purging from porn and saying, I'll never do it again, and then binging on it. Because... It's such a good and beautiful part of us, and yet it's loaded with shame. So instead of facing our sexual urges and fantasies, we think, oh, I, I got to fight this. I got to remember my Bible verses and, and try to overcome this, or we try to avoid it. And that's not necessarily bad, but as long as we're fighting something, it has power over us. I first heard that in the book, Setting Us Free by Nick Stumbo, where he quotes Anthony DeMello. As long as you are fighting something, it has power over you. The same goes for avoiding something or ignoring something. And this is why our typical attitude in the church has been silence and judgment and shame around sexuality. We are repressing it. 
rather than learning how to embrace it and express it in a healthy way. Well, when you repress sexuality, how do you motivate yourself to try to do this? Because it really is frustrating and exhausting. The motivation comes from what I call the military mindset. In other words, if you want to get free from porn, then you need to be a warrior. You need to fight the battle. You need to be a conqueror. You need to toughen yourself up, man. Toughness rather than tenderness. And unfortunately, most men's ministries promote this. Now, for me, when I was first starting out, this military mindset really did help motivate me. It got me into recovery. And I thought, yeah, I can do it. And I did to a degree for a while. In the end, I was still fighting that battle. And in the end, eventually I lost. And I discovered that this military mindset, while it's important and it's good and spiritual warfare is real, it can make us feel like we're fighting against our sexuality rather than fighting for the sake of our sexuality. And that's why I have mixed feelings about resources like the Conquer series. The Conquer series is a video series put together by Kingdom Works Studios and Dr. Ted Roberts, who is an amazing trauma therapist, former pastor, such a wise man of God. And Dr. Ted Roberts actually trained personally under Dr. Patrick Carnes and took so much of Carnes' insights and brought them to the Christian community. There's so much good in the Conquer series. And also, it can give you this feeling like my sexuality is the enemy and I need to conquer it. And it doesn't help that all of Dr. Ted's metaphors come from his experiences as a fighter pilot in the Vietnam War. And then in the sequel to the Conquer series called Warpath, they take this military mindset even further. Here's a screenshot from Warpath. When I saw this, I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought they have three tanks pointing at the men, not to mention the pointing finger of Dr. Doug Weiss. And Dr. Doug Weiss, he believes in the gospel. He preaches the grace and the love of Jesus. But the whole way that this thing is presented can ultimately make you feel more shame. Look at this picture. When you see that face, how does it make you feel? When I've taught this class before, men have said, I feel scared. I feel more shame. I feel contempt. I feel intimidated. I feel angry. I feel tense. I feel like I am the enemy. Even if the message coming out of those lips is one of grace and truth, the military mindset still keeps all of this in the realm of purity culture, making me feel worse about myself. And ultimately, in my case, that would be part of my reason for acting out, feeling even worse about myself because I can't measure up and because I keep losing this endless battle. Well, if you take the military mindset seriously, then it's going to have some implications for your life. How do we enforce the military mindset? With what I call the porn police. You get things like accountability reports to check in and have surveillance on your sexual behavior. Maybe you get porn filters and blockers like digital prison cells trying to keep your sexuality under control or other strategies that are ultimately based on performance and punishment. And this is what most of the porn recovery movement actually promotes. They want you to try to manage your sin rather than really heal. And when you're in some kind of purity group or even a 12-step group, it can often feel like a reenactment of that rigid, disengaged family where there are strict rules, inflexible beliefs, and not a lot of heart to heart, deep, vulnerable intimacy. So a lot of times in our porn recovery groups, we end up recreating the very conditions that created our problem in the first place, the recipe for sexual addiction. And if that wasn't enough, if you actually succeed at this entire system, you accept the toxic shame. You say, I'm going to repress my sexuality. I'm going to be a warrior with the military mindset. And you decide to implement the porn police in your life. 
if you actually succeed, purity culture makes some promises that are ultimately false promises. The primary message of purity culture is don't have sex before you're married, assuming that one day you will get married. And when you do get married, many of us receive promises. Rather than I must be pure or else, it's like, okay, if you are pure, whatever that means, then when you get married, what will happen? Finish this sentence for me. What were the promises that you internalized while you were growing up? When you get married one day, because you will get married, at least that's the assumption, what will happen? When I've taught this class previously, here's what people said. When you get married, you'll have sex all the time. All the problems and struggles will stop. Your urges and addictions will go away. You'll only be attracted to your spouse and your wife will satisfy all your needs. In other words, you won't need your previous sexual outlets like porn and masturbation because you'll have a new one in your wife. Do you hear how objectifying and lustful that is? How dehumanizing that is to treat my spouse as a replacement for pornography? That's not love. That's not marriage. But purity culture sets us up to see marriage as the solution to our sexual brokenness. In reality, marriage doesn't make porn go away. You know what happened on my wedding night? When I found that I wasn't able to respond to my wife sexually in the way that I was so excited to do. I felt like, okay, well, I have to perform. I have to get an erection. So you know what came into my head? Pornographic fantasies. And that's been a journey for me too, even as a married person, even if I'm not using porn, there's still the temptation to imagine it in my mind while I'm with my wife physically, which is essentially using her body as an outlet for my pornographic fantasies. That's what happens when we see marriage as the solution to our sexual brokenness. In reality, here's what really happens. Marriage unites two people as one flesh and therefore spreads the brokenness. It spreads the suffering because now my wife has to experience the effects of my brokenness in addition to her own. That creates a huge mess. Marriage does not make things easier. It does not make it easier to be free from porn. In fact, it makes things harder because now there are two people who have to heal. Now there's a marriage that has to heal, not just an individual. Do you see how purity culture sets us up for a massive disappointment? It assumes that one day we will get married. And if you are married, then that is the solution for your sexual attractions and urges and any kind of brokenness. Marriage will save you. No, it won't. And many of us have had to find this out the hard way. And it makes me really angry. And that's the final failure of purity culture, false promises. So there you have it, the five failures of purity culture, toxic shame, resulting in sexual repression, the military mindset, and the porn police. And to top it all off, false promises. This is so deceptive. Purity culture presents the illusion of freedom, making you think, oh, this is what it looks like to be free. But in reality, it's just another form of repression and slavery. Just like porn presents the illusion of intimacy, and it's actually not the real thing. It's just the surface level. Purity culture doesn't give you deep healing. It just gives you the illusion that you've solved this problem in your life. But in the end, it leaves you even more frustrated and exhausted. Even if you succeed and you do everything right, all it takes is one moment to, for you to feel like you're back in that place of toxic shame. And that is not what Jesus wants for us. He wants honor and love and freedom and joy. Not this repression and control and constriction. He has something so much better for us than the fear and the shame of purity culture. Because you know what? Ultimately, that repression of attack, avoid, ignore, it's all based on fear. Jesus gives us something better, which is love. So if you're feeling frustrated and exhausted by fighting the constant battle, man, you're not alone. Let me tell you about Corey. Corey says, I did every type of physical restriction possible. 
I went a year and a half without any internet connection in my house, whatever it takes. I was trying to fix a deep spiritual and emotional issue with a physical band-aid, and that can only last for so long. That is purity culture. Corey was steeped in this approach to things, and he did everything. And you know what happened after he got internet again? Porn came back into his life. But after he was able to break out of purity culture and take a different approach, he says, I honestly feel like a completely new person. The confidence, the peace of mind, I really can't describe it. All that groundwork I previously laid finally clicked when I started to understand my why and got plugged into a community with a coach who knows what he's doing. Man, the difference is like night and day. So here's my question for you. Are you ready to escape purity culture so you can finally escape porn? If so, say yes. Purity culture says, fight your sexuality, which is ultimately kind of like trying to put a cork on a volcano. (laughs) At Husband Material, we say, face your sexuality. Get closer to it. Walk toward it so you can understand it, so you can heal it. How do we do that? You might be wondering, okay, purity culture says don't think about your sexuality. Don't talk about it. Just get rid of it unless you're married with your wife in bed, and then you can let it out. Husband Material says no. Face it. Get closer to it. At Husband Material, we take a completely different approach, and that's what I'm about to teach you in secret number two. The simple trick to hack any sexual fantasy, and strip porn of its seductive power. Have you ever used Google Translate? It's pretty fun. You can put any word from any language in the world, and it will translate it into your language so you can understand it. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could do that with our sexual attractions and fantasies? To enter it into something like Google Translate, and then, oh, out comes the explanation. That's actually what I've learned how to do, and that's what I'm going to teach you how to do so that you can see what's going on below the specific types of porn, the specific sexual fantasies that appeal to you. How to hack any sexual fantasy. You can become a fantasy hacker. And by the way, I did not invent what I'm about to teach you. Patrick Carnes was talking about it decades ago. Ted Roberts and Mark Lacer began to take some of his insights about this to the Christian community. And then most recently, Jay Stringer has helped us put it together in a Christ-centered framework of really being able to understand our fantasies as a roadmap to healing. So I'm building off of the wisdom of the amazing Christ-centered clinicians who have come before me and sharing that with you now in a way that's understandable and simple enough so that you can apply it to your life and strip porn of its power. The first step is to actually face your fantasies. And this is what I mean by focus on them. You have to know what they are. You have to know what you're going to enter into the translator if you're actually going to do this work. So let me give you a case study. This is Nico. He's not a real person. He's a combination of many of my clients and some of my own story too. Nico has a specific type of porn that really appeals to him. It's a video of an older man and a younger man on a camping trip. They're in a natural setting. And the part of the video that's most arousing to him is when they undress each other. Interesting. He often doesn't even finish the video, but he stops it right there because that's enough for him to be able to masturbate to it. How about you? What's your fantasy? Who's involved? Men, women, both? Older, younger, body type? Who's in power? Who's in control? Where does it take place? What are they doing? Who's doing what? Does it involve anything specific or strange? All of that is significant. Okay, you might need a moment to write it down to get very specific about what your fantasy is and actually admit this to yourself, to face it, whatever is most arousing or appealing to you, even if you wish it wasn't that. Then once you've got clarity on what your fantasy is, 
Then you got to trace your triggers. There are two kinds of triggers, pain triggers and pleasure triggers. Pain trigger is something that's happening in your life that is so intolerable that it drives you to pornography. Or a pleasure trigger is a person or something you see online that is so irresistible that it drives you to porn. And as I like to say, every trigger tells a story. When you trace your triggers, you're going to discover the story behind it. You got to ask the magic questions. Write this down. Remember this. As we ask the question, okay, why is this fantasy here? Where does it come from? What's the explanation? What's the translation? First, pinpoint what exactly is most triggering for you and whatever it is. How does it make you feel? And when have you felt the exact opposite of that feeling? That's the key for the fantasy. How does it make you feel? And when have you felt the exact opposite? That's what we do for a pleasure trigger. And we see, okay, that's the pleasure. Well, when have you felt the pain? Or for a pain trigger, how does it make you feel? And when have you felt that way before? Now we begin to uncover the stories behind our sexual and emotional triggers. Let's talk about Nico. What is most triggering for him? It's that moment of the video when the men are undressing each other, unzipping their pants. For him, that feels exciting and intimate and it feels natural. Okay, now when have you felt the exact opposite of those things, Nico? In other words, when have you felt bored instead of excited? When have you felt isolated instead of intimate? And when have you felt like a relationship was forced instead of natural? And when we ask these questions, the stories come flooding back. And for him, he would say, I felt that way in church. Church has always been a huge pain trigger for Nico. Sometimes he would attend church and immediately watch porn right after he got home. Even if it was an amazing worship service. How can that be? Well, every trigger tells a story. And Nico grew up spending a lot of time in church, actually. He was a pastor's kid. And his dad was up there every week preaching a sermon while he was sitting there admiring his father, basking in the brilliance of his preaching, and also sandwiched between his mom and his three sisters, totally surrounded by these women. And because his dad was often so busy and so occupied and absent doing ministry, Nico's mom turned to him for a lot of the emotional support that she wasn't getting and that he wasn't getting either. And so here we have a boy who's surrounded by women, feeling smothered, too close to them while his dad is so far away. And guess what else is happening? All the kids at church see him as the pastor's kid, which gives them plenty of ammunition for bullying. They would tease him. If he kept all the rules while they were breaking some of the rules, they would make fun of him for being too good. But then if he actually joined them and broke the rules, then they would criticize him for not being the good little pastor's kid. So here's his world. It's a painful world. Church is a place that he didn't really want to go back to, and for good reason. It was a place where he felt far away from dad, too close to mom, and bullied by his peers. So how does this translate into some of his childhood messages and core beliefs? Well, he began to accept the fact that men don't want me, that women are suffocating and overpowering. He couldn't go where he wanted and do what he wanted to do. And this is huge. This was his survival strategy with the other boys. I have to be good, but not too good. In other words, I can't be myself. 
Whew. So all of this is contributing to the pain trigger of being in church, which is supposed to be a place of love and acceptance and, and what many see as the solution to freedom from porn. It should be a place that's encouraging. So in other words, church, the very place that should be safe, was not safe for him. Now let's look at the porn fantasy in light of all this. It's the exact mirror opposite. Instead of being cooped up in this church building, sandwiched between all of these people who he doesn't feel connected to, when he is out in nature, he's actually able to worship God in a way that he never could in church. Women are far, far away. In fact, they're not even there. And men, specifically an older man, a father figure is close. You know, Nico's dad used to promise him that they would go camping, that they would take a weekend off of church. And they never did. So do you see how much pleasure this fantasy would give to a boy who just wanted to be with his dad? Who just wanted to be one of the guys? Who just wanted a little bit of adventure rather than the suffocating boredom and isolation, feeling surrounded by people and connected to no one, sitting in the back pews for multiple sermons, out in the sanctuary of God's creation, having healthy male bonding is what he really needed. So here's the mirror image. His sexual fantasy is an exact reversal of the story of suffering that he's carried with him, even without knowing it. Do you see the difference? Do you see how it all fits? Now, what do we do with this information? <laughs> how do I translate it all into something that can actually help me in my life? Once you have faced your fantasies and traced your triggers, then you can discover your desires. Let's review. So for Nico, when he feels bored or isolated or forced in a social situation, especially in church, those triggers drive him to porn, to a specific type of sexual fantasy where he can be with an older man in a natural setting, undressing each other, which makes sense. But what's underneath that? There's a desire for adventure, for intimacy, and for authenticity. For adventure rather than boredom. For intimacy rather than isolation. For authenticity rather than feeling like, oh, I just can't be myself. And all of that is good. It's from God. We can bless it. And actually, you can pursue that in a healthy way. And I'm about to tell you how. So for Nico... If we do a little fantasy hacking translation, that video of men alone in nature undressing each other comes down to his desire for adventure and intimacy and authenticity that he should have had that he didn't get. I wonder, what about you? What do you deeply desire? When you think about your triggers and your fantasies and how they make you feel, what is porn promising to your heart that you deeply desire? Here's a list of 40 different desires that I've created in partnership with my clients. Desires for acceptance, adventure, affirmation, authenticity, beauty, being desired, being known, being pursued, being seen, belonging, certainty, community, connection, control, delight, escape, friendship, honesty, honor, inclusion, intimacy, love, nurture, peace, play, pleasure, power, provision, protection, purpose, relief, rescue, rest, safety, significance, strength, tenderness, thrill, touch, and worth. Take a moment and ask yourself, what is it that you deeply desire? I like to call these divine desires. 
which is a phrase I got from Michael Cusick in his book, Surfing for God, Discovering the Divine Desire Beneath Sexual Struggle. And what you will find is that your deepest desires reveal the stories of suffering in your life and vice versa. The stories of suffering, how have you suffered in your life most deeply will reveal what you long for, what you ache for. If you grew up in chaos, it makes sense that you would desire peace. If you grew up feeling invisible, of course you desire to be seen. If you grew up suffering harshness, my friend, your desire for tenderness is good. It's from God. And so even as we begin to face our sexual attractions and fantasies underneath them, we find aches and longings that are from God. And he wants to give them to us in a way that's so much more satisfying and deep than porn. When we use pornography to try to get some of these desires, in reality, we are just reinforcing the story of suffering. If one of my desires is acceptance, and I turn to porn for that, it's actually going to make me feel even more rejected and unacceptable in the end. So porn is not giving us the desire. It's actually reinforcing and repeating the stories of suffering that drove us to it. The pain, the reason why we needed a pacifier. Porn just repeats that, deepens it, and then in the end, it doesn't satisfy our desires. It dampens them. Think about that. Purity culture dampens your desires by trying to shut them down because sex is nasty, sex is bad, sex is gross. Porn also tries to dampen your desires by getting you to settle for something less. Not because sex is casual, it's whatever. And in the end, God will forgive me, so why not? In the end, I'm just going to go back to it. So why not skip all of the strain and all of the effort and just, just give in? It's dampening our desires rather than deepening our desires. Now, what does that look like? Well, first... It looks like discovering your desires. Let me tell you about Ken. Ken said that by going through the unwanted workbook that I created with Jay Stringer, he said, I discovered that my holy longing was simply to feel accepted and connected. I also had a desire to be naked and found as many opportunities as possible, which turned out to be a holy longing to pull down my facade my curtains, my layers and layers of constructed coverings, and be honest and vulnerable. Do you hear the similarity there of that and the undressing, the unzipping fantasy of pulling down the facade, pulling down the curtains of being real? Now that, that is a divine desire. And Ken says, I have enjoyed six months of sobriety and sanity. A few months ago, I got to celebrate a year with him too. He says, I am beginning to experience true sexuality and sensuality. I don't push it. I just allow it to settle upon me as a gift from God. It has been wonderful. Do you hear the difference between what Ken is saying and fighting the battle for purity? It's not militant. It's not toughening up. It's not toughness that will heal you. It's tenderness. It's kindness. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. That's what the book of Romans says in chapter 2. And it's embracing and expressing our sexuality and our good desires in a healthy way that ultimately allows us to say, hey, I don't need this pacifier anymore because I got my desire. Now, how do you actually achieve that? I'm about to tell you. But first, I want to ask, are you willing to target one of your sexual fantasies so you can finally face it and trace it and discover your desires. 
Are you willing to do this work? If so, say yes. Whisper it. Shout it. That's your second commitment. That's what I want you to do. That's what I do every week with myself and with the men that I help. It's so much deeper and it's so much more substantial than anything purity culture can offer. I believe this is the most important question. If you can answer this question, what do I do with my desires? Then I believe you can completely eliminate the risk of relapse. This is the final secret I'm going to share with you today. And I realize that it's a very bold claim. If I saw somebody else publishing a book or sharing a video about how to completely eliminate the risk of relapse, I would trust that person less, not more, because that's just not how life works. And even still, I am claiming that if you can pursue your desires in the way that I'm about to describe, then you simply won't need porn anymore. The pacifier will become irrelevant because you already have what you've been searching for the whole time. And when you feel so full and whole and satisfied and your desires are being met, there's no space for anything else to intrude. Let me tell you what it looks like to actually pursue your desires in a way that eliminates the risk of relapse so that you can have confidence that porn really is in the past, that you don't have to worry about a relapse being right around the corner. It's when you have the four streams of desire flowing to you and through you in your life, the four streams of desire. Everybody needs these four streams and for each person, it's customized. It's individualized. This is your exact path to outgrow porn, to achieve lasting freedom. Are you ready for it? Here are the four streams of desire. First of all, remember your desire when I asked you, what do you deeply desire? Choose one word. Maybe it was acceptance or connection. Maybe it was safety. Remember that word? Got it? Okay. Here are the four streams. Number one, get it from God. God has created us with these desires and they are good. And these desires are ultimately intended to be satisfied by him. That's why they're divine. He wants to be the one. He wants to be our acceptance. He wants to be our safety. He wants to be the one who pursues us, who sees us, who knows us, who protects us. He wants to be our peace. He wants to be the one who gives us value and worth. And when we find our desires met by him, nothing else can replace that. Now that's our foundation. It's not the complete picture though because it's not good for us to be alone. And ultimately, if all we're doing is getting this desire met in a spiritual way by God, there are huge parts of who we are that are incomplete. And in fact, our sexuality, coming from the Latin secare, to cut off, is talking about this incompleteness that we feel. God made us to be completed by him and also in community with other people. And this is kind of scary to seek out my desire with others. Because if I am real and honest and vulnerable and open with other people, pursuing them, seeking to have this desire met, well, what happens when they reject me? What happens when it's not safe? What if, instead of affirming me, they criticize me? Well, that would take me back into the story of suffering. And then I'd feel triggered again. Hmm. Pursuing our divine desires with other people is scary, it's risky, and it's absolutely necessary for healing. As Dr. Ted Roberts in Pure Desire Ministries has often said, we were wounded in relationship and we need to be healed in relationship. 
without relationship, without another person mediating the presence of God, we will still feel incomplete. Our desires must be met with others. And here is the one that often gets overlooked. And it's very deep. We need to learn how to give what we desire to ourselves in a healthy way. I need to learn how to accept myself. I need to learn how to protect myself. I need to learn how to give myself the things that I needed as a little boy and didn't get. The little boy who was first exposed to porn. The little boy who was abandoned or abused or neglected or rejected. He's still with you. He's within you. And he needs your help. He needs you to come and give him what he needs so that he can grow up. So that he can put down the pacifier. Because it's not the mature adult version of you that's still struggling with porn. It's the boy. And when he can get the love and the affirmation and the attention and the acceptance that is his birthright. My God, it's beautiful. When you can take the love of God that you have received and offer it to yourself, the healing goes so deep. And yet there's one more stream that's maybe the most important for us to embrace is overflowing what I desire to others. For example, if my divine desire is for acceptance, then when I overflow acceptance to another person, now I'm fully embracing my calling and my destiny. The stories of suffering that we've experienced, for example, of rejection, have shown us what it's like to be rejected. And oftentimes, I think our divine desire kind of becomes a superpower. What you desire is probably something that you're very good at giving to other people. And when you can step into that with a mission, with a purpose, then you can pursue a life worth living. And notice how I said we overflow to others. I'm not giving somebody acceptance, hoping that they will accept me. I'm giving it to them because I already have it. Because I've received it from God. I found it with other people. I've been able to give it to myself. And now I can give it to you. Expecting nothing in return. When these four streams are flowing in your life, it's beautiful. That's the way God intended us to live. And that's what allows us to enjoy life, to not have to feel like I'm constantly fighting a battle because I'm flowing in the four streams. With all four streams of desire flowing through your life, do you think you could live without porn? Do you think you could feel confident in yourself? Do you think you could feel connected? Do you think you could live your calling without feeling the need to consume, without the need for a pacifier. I think you could. Let me tell you about Charlie. Charlie is the guy in the video that you watched who used to stay up all night sexually acting out with porn and then he would smash his iPad in the morning. Talk about fighting the battle for purity. He eventually got to a place where the four streams were flowing to the point that he said, as of today, I'm two years porn free. And this summer, I'm celebrating with him three years of freedom from porn. He said, I'm a lot more clear headed. I'm able to take care of myself better emotionally, physically, spiritually. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I feel free. I don't feel isolated. I don't feel insignificant like this addiction can make you feel. Most importantly, I feel seen. Do you see his divine desires? Rather than feeling isolated, he's connected. Rather than feeling insignificant, he has a purpose. And rather than being invisible, he feels seen. 
He's giving himself what he needed, taking care of himself emotionally, physically, spiritually. That is freedom. That is health. That is becoming a sexual adult. And it's what happens when you can identify your desires, receive them from God, find them with other people, give them to yourself, and then overflow, my friend. Man, this is what it looks like to be free, to be confident, to be a sexually healthy man of God. When you have these four streams flowing to you and through you in your life, this is how you can have the assurance that a relapse is not right around the corner. And when you feel like your fantasies and attractions and urges are surging and they're stronger than usual and you're like, man, I'm struggling more than I usually do. What's going on here? You can use these four streams to ask yourself, where am I getting stuck? Which of these streams has slow flow rather than a rushing river? Because when you're swept up in having your desire met by God, found with other people, experiencing it for yourself and overflowing to others, there's not a lot that can get in your way. This journey is not easy, but it's also not complicated. It's pretty simple. My question for you is, will you pursue the four streams of desire until you become a sexually healthy man? That's a big commitment because these desires don't just come to us. We have to pursue them. And there are all kinds of obstacles that come up. Obstacles on the inside and on the outside. Obstacles of fear and shame and guilt and anger and loneliness and obstacles of the people in our lives or the lack of people in our lives. I mean, it's like the enemy is so happy to keep us content, to keep our desires dampened rather than deepened. Because when we deepen our desires, we just might pursue them. And when we pursue them, we just might get them. Met by God. Finding those desires with other people. Giving them to ourselves in a healthy way and overflowing to others. Man, that is a life worth living. That is the kingdom of God coming on this earth. Are you committed to that? Will you pursue the four streams of desire now that you know what they are? Until you become a sexually healthy man. I realize that if you say yes to this question you are taking on a huge challenge. This journey is not easy. It's also not complicated. Four streams. Will you pursue them until you become a sexually healthy man? That's a big question. And I've shared a lot of information with you today. So let's do a quick recap. First, we talked about the typical approach to freedom from porn, which is purity culture, the porn police and the military mindset and all of that. And then I gave you a completely different approach, hacking your sexual fantasies, facing your sexuality so you can understand it and so you can heal and so you can actually pursue your desires in a healthy way. Now you know what it looks like not to dampen your desires. Not to repress your sexuality, but to experience redeemed sexuality as God intended. That is the real path to freedom from porn. That is the path to healing and wholeness and maturity. The path to becoming the man that you were created to be. Let me sum it all up for you. In the end, what actually works? What actually helps you drop the pacifier and outgrow porn? Changing your brain and healing your heart, self-awareness, and self-compassion. Understanding where all of these sexual triggers and attractions and fantasies come from, learning how to manage them, and giving yourself what you needed that you didn't get when you were a boy. Finding those desires satisfied eliminates the place that porn has occupied for so many years. And when you get particular and specific 
on this new life that God is leading you into, then you have direction. And when you have that, you can put down the pacifier, go live the life you were created for, and finally outgrow porn. Thank you so much for being a part of this class. I want to follow up on my mission that I shared with you at the beginning of class. Right now in this moment, do you feel less shame and more compassion? Do you feel less confusion and more clarity? And do you feel less despair and more hope? Ultimately, do you feel more confident in being able to live without porn? If the answer is yes, then today has already been a success. And from here, right now, you have two choices. Option number one, take the new approach you learned today and try to do it on your own. Or option two, take the new approach you learned today and let me be your guide. Now, what could that look like? If you're interested in working with me, then let me introduce you to Husband Material Academy, also known as HMA. HMA is the all-in-one solution for Christian men outgrowing pornography. It is my signature online program with men from around the world who are changing our brains, healing our hearts, and saving our relationships. The first part of HMA is a training course with 36 videos and action steps with the single goal of revealing and healing. Revealing what's broken and healing it with the power of Christ. The healing power of love, of curiosity, of compassion and courage, not purity culture. Everything is online. You can do it from your phone. You can do it from your computer. Let me tell you a quick story about one of my students who has been through the course. This guy is an overseas worker who lives in Southeast Asia who prefers to remain anonymous. He has been involved in Celebrate Recovery for almost two decades. He's a leader. And although he has had a lot of freedom from sexually acting out with other men in person, porn still had a place in his life. Here's what he said after taking the HMA course. He said, once we started to look at the little boy within me and the fact that he deserved to be loved, affirmed, validated, hugged, known, and pursued, freedom and understanding poured in. I was finally able to reach the one year mark and have kept going. Ultimately, it's not about behavior and maintaining your streak of sexual sobriety. Ultimately, it's about becoming a new person. And that's what this course helps you do. As you complete the HMA training course, pornography will lose its power one day at a time as you completely transform your brain and your heart and your relationship. The training course is awesome, but HMA includes so much more. The second feature is our weekly coaching calls on Wednesdays. We actually have two of these calls at two different times for structure and support, for group activities and one-on-one -on -one time with other students where we celebrate each other's progress. We work through questions that come up. I do a little bit of teaching. We pray together and all the replays are made available to all students. So even if you can't make it at a specific time, you can still watch a replay. Ethan is one of our regulars at Community Wednesday. He recently graduated college and lost a lot of his support and community. He said, I didn't think I could have a community like this online, but I've been floored by the openness, structure, intentionality, and freshness of Community Wednesdays. Keeps pushing me out of my comfort zone in such a redemptive way. There are a lot of video courses out there on how to get free from porn. And you know what? Most people don't complete them because there's no support. There's no coaching. So you lose your motivation and you lose your momentum. Not at HMA. You get the course, you get the coaching calls, and you get a private community at the HMA Student Center, which is a section of the Husband Material community for HMA students only. This is the best place to find committed allies who can stick with you for the entire course. What we do after you join HMA is we help you start a triad with other students. We have a private directory where you can find other guys who are similar to your age and stage in recovery, and maybe even in your same time zone, and be able to connect with each other so that you can process what you're learning and support each other when you need it the most. You might be wondering, what is a triad? It's just a group of three students who are going through HMA together. Justin was someone who wasn't sure if he would be able to form a triad 
or if he would be able to find community in HMA. Partly because he said, I was hesitant because I didn't want to get stuck with people that I didn't get along with. And also partly because he lived in Italy. Justin has roots in Malaysia and Australia, and he was living in Italy, and his time zone wasn't the best for most people. But he found Thomas in Spain and Joseph in Chicago, and they formed a triad, and he has loved it. He says, they're the brothers I never had. To experience love the way God intended is such an important ingredient to my recovery journey. Since Thomas is close to his time zone, they can talk whenever, and he says when it's late at night and he's feeling triggered, Joseph, who's seven hours behind him, is eating dinner, and he loves to get a call. This is the kind of community we're creating. Brothers in Christ around the world supporting each other and going through this material together forms a kind of depth of friendship that I've frankly never seen before. When you immerse yourself in HMA, into this community, you will make lasting friendships with amazing men of God. This is why I say HMA is an all-in-one solution, because you get the course, you get the coaching, and you get the student center, the community. You get the program you need, the professional guidance and support that you need, and you get the peer support that you need, the people around you who are supporting you, who you are supporting as we all grow deeper in Christ together and become sexually healthy men of God. Imagine yourself healed. What would you give for that? What would that be worth for you? I had one client who said that if he got divorced, it would cost him a million dollars. And that's exactly what would happen if he didn't achieve lasting freedom from porn. So you can see why people in that position would sometimes pursue residential treatment. If you go to a place like Capstone in Arkansas, or Keystone in Pennsylvania, or Hope Quest in Georgia, it could cost you $50,000. But it's worth it for people because they want the results and because it's giving them an all-in-one solution. It's giving them the program and the professionals and the peer support all in one. Unfortunately, oftentimes when people go back to their homes, they're just back in the same old environment as before. So residential treatment can be awesome, but it's so expensive that most people can't do it. And even if you could do it, you come home and maybe things change or maybe they don't. So you can see why something like professional counseling or therapy for $150 an hour or $600 per month would feel more doable for people. Of course, that's only one part of the picture. It's not an all-in-one solution. It's just one piece of it. So you'd think that HMA, with everything that we're offering, would cost at least $600 a month. The cost of Husband Material Academy is $59 per month, less than 10% of the cost of going to a professional counselor for $150 once a week. This is the best option for any Christian man who wants to achieve lasting freedom from porn in a way that gives you so much more than you would get trying some other kind of solution. You can sign up at joinhma.com, and when you do, you will also get our 60-day outgrow guarantee. In other words, because I'm so convinced that HMA will help you heal and grow, I'm giving you 60 days to try it out with zero risk. And if you don't absolutely love HMA for any reason, just contact me and I'll give you a full 100% refund with no questions asked because I believe in it that much. And even if you do this, we will let you keep access to the student center and to something else that I'll tell you about as one of the bonuses, which you can keep forever. Even if you get a refund, even if you cancel your account, we still want you to maintain access to the community. Our goal in HMA is to remove every barrier between Christian men and freedom from porn. So join HMA and experience life-changing growth or pay nothing. It's that simple. And when you sign up now at joinhma.com, you will also get a bonus called Trigger Tuesdays. Every single Tuesday night, we do something called hot seat coaching, where one brave HMA student gets in the hot seat and tells a story from his childhood or teenage years or even from adulthood, a story which is related to some of his present day emotional or sexual triggers or attractions or behaviors. And then we process that story live in front of any other students. The only people you can see are me or whoever the coach is and the person telling his story. 
And our simple goal is to make connections between the story and his sexuality. You get to see the power of what it's like to experience new self-awareness and self-compassion. As you watch other men's stories, you'll see your own story in a new light. And whenever you get the courage to go in the hot seat, it's pretty simple. You let me know and we schedule a time. This is totally unique. I don't know of any other program anywhere in the world where men are doing this work in front of each other in this way, where men are being vulnerable and real and open about their sexual struggles and their childhood stories. And then at the end of the call, we share words of life and affirmation and love. Because whoever just had the bravery to go in the hot seat, he needs some love. So at the end of every Trigger Tuesday, we share. Trigger Tuesday is completely unique. Let me tell you about somebody who's actually done it. This is Matthew. When I first met Matthew, he was working for a church where he didn't have a safe place to tell his story. With the staff, with his congregation, it felt like there was nowhere for him to go. And if he was completely honest, he might lose his job. When Matthew came and shared his story on Trigger Tuesday and with a small group, this is what he said. I didn't know that healing was going to take place in a matter of 30 minutes. I didn't know that I needed you men to speak into my life in the way that all of you did. So much healing took place. Wow. I can breathe for the first time in a long time. And his story is not the exception. We see it every single week. So Tuesday is Trigger Tuesday. On Wednesday, we do Community Wednesday group calls. And then on Friday, we do Fantasy Fridays. Now, all of these calls are optional, but if you want to show up to Fantasy Friday, prepare yourself because on Fantasy Friday, we do complex trauma work. An HMA student will come with something that's bothering him or disturbing him, like anger or a specific sexual fantasy or something that's troubling and disturbing or even a story from childhood that he's never told anyone before. And on Fantasy Fridays, we invite Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit into those places. And I get to witness the amazing transformation and deep healing that comes when the love of God touches us in the places where we're broken. Fantasy Fridays can be emotional. It's the most emotion I've ever seen men share, especially in an online environment. And one great example of that is Marcus. Marcus is someone who had had a few years of freedom from his sexual behavior, but he still felt like he was fighting a battle and he was getting tired of it. Well, when he came to Fantasy Friday, he was able to release some things that he had been holding on to for a long time. He said, I can't tell you the last time I cried that hard and for that long ever. It was exhausting and emotional, but oh Lord, was it freeing and beautiful at the same time. I am experiencing a level of freedom that I never knew was possible. Freedom beyond the battle, freedom beyond the stress and beyond the struggle to be able to give and receive love. That is what Fantasy Fridays are all about. At each of these calls, when you attend, you will find yourself becoming more compassionate, more courageous, both compassionate for others and for yourself, and courageous that after you watch a few people get in the hot seat, you might just have the courage to take a turn for yourself. And not only that, we have one more amazing bonus, which is an international SOS. This is a WhatsApp group where HMA students offer each other 24-7 support because we have men all around the world. So if it's 3 a.m. for you, it might be 3 p.m. for somebody else somewhere in the world. And our goal with this SOS is to be able to pray for each other, to be able to support each other whenever we need it. When you get this HMA International SOS, whenever you feel triggered, you will only be one message away from prayer and support. You'll never be alone. So here's what you get when you join Husband Material Academy. You get the video course. You get the coaching calls every week with all HMA students invited. You get the community, the student center, the directory, forming triads and small groups with other students that we help you create. And you get the hot seat calls. You get Trigger Tuesdays and Fantasy Fridays where you also have the chance to go in the hot seat whenever you're ready 
And you have the international SOS where you can call for help at any time and know that HMA students will be there. This is the full package. This is why I'm calling it an all-in-one solution and there's no other program like it. And the cost is $59 per month. That's less than $2 per day. We do have an annual plan for $597 per year. And if you have any questions about HMA or about freedom from porn, please find my contact information below. You can email me, you can send me a text message at my work phone number, or we can even schedule a brief call to talk about it. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for committing to attending this whole presentation, for going deeper, for finding out what you need to know to outgrow porn for good. Join HMA at joinhma.com. I hope to see you in there. And I want you to always remember that you are God's beloved son and in you, he is well pleased.